This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're continuing with part two of our conversation with Nina Lakani. She's the senior climate justice reporter for The Guardian U.S. She was just covering the U.N. climate summit um, in Dubai, where we were. We actually shared a wall uh, between our mm -hmm. offices. And while the climate summit was happening, news came down about the mastermind of the killer of Berta Cáceres. Nina Lacani is the author of Who Killed Berta Cáceres? Dams, Death Squads, and an Indigenous Defender's Battle for the Planet. Um, this month, Honduran authorities issued an arrest warrant for the suspected mastermind of the 2016 murder of the indigenous environmental leader, Berta Cáceres, in her home. Danielle Atalamidens is the former financial manager of the hydroelectric company DESA. Berta Cáceres assassinated as she led the fight against DESA's massive hydroelectric dam on a river in southwestern Honduras that's sacred to the Lenca people. Last year, David Castillo, a former U.S.-trained Honduran military officer and businessman, was sentenced to over 22 years for his role in ordering and planning uh, Berta's assassination. We have spoken to a number of uh, Berta Cáceres' family members, but, Nina, you wrote the book on her murder. And if you can first tell us about, as we start in part one of this conversation, the significance of um, Medenz being uh, 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 there an arrest warrant being for him, and then fit it into um, the U.N. Climate Summit when we got the news. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, so um, Daniel Atalamidens, you know, he, like you said, he was the financial manager. So him and um, David Castillo, um, who was the president of DESA, they basically ran the company, the day-to-day -day operations. And what I know, what we learned from the sort of the two murder trials that we've had so far is that, you know, th th they were sort of, you know, they were the ones that were intricately involved in all the day-to-day -day decisions. And that included um, um, Atala Midens, he was the one that would authorize payments to informants, like insiders in the um, people in the Rio Blanco and the Lenca community, who were basically um, informing um, the security managers and um, the security sort of um, chiefs, who were also U.S. trained, um, um, former U.S. trained ex-military officers, um, about Berta's whereabouts, and that included in the run up to her being murdered in uh, March 2016. Um, and so he, you know, he he was very, he's very much involved in all the sort of everything that went on. And what we learned in Castillo's trial um, is that he was actually called as a witness by the family's lawyers, and the, the court accepted him as a witness. And then at the very on the, right at the very last minute, um, he he was forced to turn up, but he was excused from giving testimony because the state prosecutors admitted that he was actually under investigation himself um so that so that so that he didn't um i guess um implicate himself by giving evidence the judges recused him so you know several years later um he you know this arrest warrant really comes out of the blue i mean we've had we've had nothing from the prosecutor's office from the attorney general's office at all and then it dropped um and actually it, it dropped um, the day before the Honduran um, president, Ziamara Castro, was at COP. And so I managed to actually get into a room where she was giving a speech about, um, about you know, carbon markets and the Honduras' sort of embracing of carbon markets. And I managed to ask her, to, you know, about the arrest and say, you know, what, and because she, at the end of her speech, she actually quoted um, something that Berta has said, part, part of Berta's speech when she won the Goldman Prize back in 2015. And I asked her to comment, you know, because it's such a significant, um, you know, step, but she just refused. She wouldn't comment at all. Um, and I, it was really, really disappointing. And I think, um, you know, I think it is a big step. It's like, you know, he's the most, I guess, um, Daniela Atala is the most um, powerful, politically powerful person to have been, um, you know, charged so far. He's he, he, so his dad and his uncles were the majority shareholder. They're part of like the big one of the most powerful um, oligarch families in the country. So it really is a big deal. Nina, I want to go to Berta Cáceres in her own words in 2015 when she won the Goldman Environmental Prize. 
Despertemos. Let us wake up. Let us wake up humankind. We are out of time. We must shake our conscience free of the rapacious capitalism, racism, and patriarchy that will only assure our own self-destruction. El río Hualcarque nos ha llamado. The Hualcarque River has called upon us, as have other gravely threatened rivers. Debemos acudir. We must answer their call. Our Mother Earth, militarized, fenced in, poisoned, a place where basic rights are systematically violated, demands that we take action. Construyamos entonces sociedades capaces de coexistir. Let us build societies that are able to coexist in a dignified way. Juntémonos y sigamos in a way that protects life. Let us come together and remain hopeful as we defend and care for the blood of this earth and of its spirits. I dedicate this award to all the rebels out there, to my mother, to the Lenca people, to Rio Blanco, and to the martyrs who gave their lives in the struggle to defend our natural resources. Thank you very much. That's Berta Cáceres in her own words in 2015, when she won the Goldman Prize. She would be assassinated a year later. And so, Nina Lacani, you wrote the book on her murder. Um, you're now talking about Medence, uh, the majority owner of Dessa, the dam she was taking on. Um, I'm a little confused. President Xiomara Castro came to the U.N. Climate Summit. Can you talk about the new uh, presidents or the new regime in Honduras' uh, approach to um, the environment and environmental defenders? She was seen, as she rose to power, as on the more progressive side. I mean, that's right. Obviously, she, um, Xiomara Castro is the wife of the former um, president, Manuel Azalaya, who was deposed in a 2009 coup. Um, she, I mean, yes, li the Libre Party is very much considered more progressive. It's certainly um, not, um, you know, mired in the same um, um, scandals and controversies around narco, you know, drug trafficking and arms trafficking as the National uh, National Party, which has, was, was in power after the coup until she came in, um, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, but really, um, the in terms of environmental defenders, this has been an absolutely terrible year in Honduras. You know, um, more than 10 um, campesino leaders, more, you know, I think a dozen, in fact, campesino leaders have been murdered in the Baja Aguan region over land disputes um, with the um, African palm conglomerates. Um, other indigenous and um, rural leaders have also been assassinated this year. The killing has not stopped, right, because the impunity hasn't stopped. And so um, I, I, I was also reporting, I did a story from Honduras this year. Um, you, I'm sure your, um, your, um, your viewers will remember the terrible case of the 43 migrants that were killed in the fire at the, in, the, in the migrant detention centre in Juarez um, on the border of um, in, in Mexico and the border of the U.S., um, back in March, well, one of those survivors was a young man from a place called Cedeño in Honduras, which is disappearing because of sea level rise. I've reported back there in 2019. Um, since then, another two to three hundred meters of land have disappeared because of because the sea level is rising. And he was a climate refugee that was caught up in this absolute nightmare and has been left with like long term um, brain impacts and he's lost the use of one hand. Um, and I, I, I say that because there are some improvements in terms of some more, you know, small, small projects that the government is trying to do. They're certainly embracing carbon markets wholeheartedly. But really, on a day to day basis, I think people are incredibly disappointed, you know, um, with, with Zema Castro and her party. I mean, I think the crackdown and the removal of civil liberties in prisons, but also for protest and other things have made people really worried at the sort of mano dura, the sort of iron fist strategy that they're taking as well. Um, is it as bad as it was under the National Party? No, um, but it's still been, there's been very little progress around land rights and environmental rights um, since, since they came to power. 
And what about um, the threats to indigenous and environmental leaders around the world? I mean, the UN COP, the climate summit, is a global gathering. But the kind of threats that people face fighting for the environment, taking on large projects uh, like this. I mean, yeah, I mean, in fact, just two days before COP got underway, a Peruvian Amazonian leader was assassinated, someone who had been fighting for um, land rights for his community for a long time and had received threats as a result of those um, of those of that work. Um, I mean, you know, it's the, the, the world, the, you know, as, as resources get tighter, as water scarcity increases and as just the sort of, ex, you know, that unchecked expansion of extractive industries, Mining, including you know, mining for critical minerals that are being that are needed for um, electrification, things like lithium and cobalt and so forth, are all going ahead in communities without consultation, without you know proper information. Especially you know, and indigenous people in, have a right to be consulted. They have a right to information. They have a right to say no. And that type of um, consultation that sort of comes under the um, ILO one six nine um, treaty. It's just not happening. And so I think what many people would say is that if, if um, you know, if, if clean energy projects and um, mining for critical minerals needed for electric cars and other electrification for the, for the, for the transition is um, we needed for the transition, just go ahead and impose in the same way that fossil fuel projects are imposed, then they pose the same existential threat to indigenous people, to indigenous people's lands, to their water sources. Nothing really changes for them because they don't stand to benefit because if business carries on the way that, as usual, when really um, these projects are imposed and they're carried out for the benefit of, of you know, international um, companies and investors, and for consumers like us, you know, then really, where, where's the benefit? Where's, you know, um, for, for indigenous people and rural people, you know, they get their land contaminated, their land taken away, water, scarce water is used up to extract minerals or, 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 um, or you know, um, or whatever resource there is, and they don't benefit at all. They're the ones that are on the sort of brunt of the harms that, you know, that go hand in hand when business is carried out without any, um, you know, without any sort of um, respect for human rights. Nina Lakani, if COP28 was a big win for big oil, um, I'm wondering two things. What most shocked you uh, going to this climate summit, um, you know, passing in the hallways constantly, the more than two 2,400 oil lobbyists, as you said, far outweighing uh, the number mm -hmm. of indigenous people? Um, but what most shocked you, but also what gave you the most hope? Um, so I think, you know, the, the shocking thing is, and you know, I, I think I, I feel like I sound like a broken record with this because it sort of goes in every story that I write. And I'm constantly, um, you know, talking about this with my colleagues is that, you know, there was a, you know, the, the fossil fuel sort of capture of COP and the industry capture of COP isn't new. The reason that we still need to have a COP and the reason that fossil, you know, that um, greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise is because this process has been captured by um, people, you know, fossil fuel industry and others and, and, you know, and banks and others that make money from this expansion from the beginning. This year, it was particularly blatant and huge, right? And that may well, like, it has to do with the fact that COP was being run by the executive of an oil, an oil and gas company. But I think that thing that surprises me most is that how, how countries like the US and Norway and Canada and the UK are so successful in painting um, the Arab states and other the Gulf countries and others as the villains, right? That you know, it's these petro petro states that they like to blame. There is no bigger petro state in the world than the United States of America, right? Um, you know, if we're talking about quantities of oil and gas expansion, the biggest villains are the US and the you know the, the the other sort of and the umbrella group of countries like Canada and Australia, the EU. They're the ones that are expanding and benefiting from oil and gas. And it just that's what shocks me is just how good they've been at be at painting themselves as the good guys, as as, as climate champions, when really they're the ones, when you follow the negotiations, they are the ones in the back rooms blocking develop any recognition of um, equity 
any move to have climate finance be fair, they're the ones that are blocking that, you know. Um, and it's yeah, I find that just it's so it's so um, it's so two faced, it's so hypocritical, you know, um, and that I find. Is it surprising that the chief executive of an oil company is trying to do oil deals at COP? Not really. What sh you know, I mean, it's terrible, yeah, but it's not really surprising, you know. Um, it's 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 shocking and, and we should be shocked at the fact that all the parties, all the countries allowed for the UAE and voted for the UAE, to, you know, to, to, to accept the UAE as a president, but also that they go there saying one thing and actually doing the other, right? You know, the US is very, very keen to have everybody um, 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 phase out coal. So is the UK. Why? Because we've, extract we've extracted all of our coal. We don't need, to, we don't care about coal anymore because most of it's gone. We quick, um, you know, these, um, we care about oil and gas. That's why it did not want um, any more strong language than the transition away from, you know, and it's so watered down. Is it historic? It's something, but it's not by nowhere near enough. And honestly, I think it really could just be the nail in the coffin for 1.5 for keeping, um, you know, global heating um, at 1.5 above industrial levels. I just don't think it's anywhere near enough. Mm. Um, in addition to the fossil fuel lobbyists, um, there's no specific mention of meat or livestock in the COP28 delegation. That's despite yeah. the fact that meat and dairy consumption are responsible for around 14.5 percent of global greenhouse yeah. gas emissions, according to the UN. COP28 had three times as many delegates representing the meat and dairy yeah. industry as last year's climate summit. Yeah, I mean, that again, right? So this is another historic um, achievement that we've all been told to like applaud, um, there that there was a food and agriculture day right, at COP. And there was some good, um, there was some good language and good agreements and decent agreements on and some, you know, some new money around climate adaptation for agriculture and food systems. But there's absolutely nothing at all about tackling the fact, as you say, that industrialised farming, particularly um, um, livestock and beef and dairy, but industrialised farming generally is a huge contributor to greenhouse gases, to, to global heating. They just got away absolutely scot-free. And this is why I feel very... Um, I don't know, jaded with the term, use of the term historic. Another historic thing that there was a health day, absolutely wild. It's the first time climate action and health have been considered together at a COP. Um, and that, was, again, was, you know, was sort of, um, you know, applauded as historic. But they in, in that sort of non-binding agreement that was signed by, I think, 100 or so countries, there is no mention of fossil fuels. I mean, the impact of fossil fuels on health, I mean, 5 million deaths a year are linked to pollution from the extraction and production of, um, of fossil fuels. Absolutely no mention of that at all. You know, it's, uh, and you just think it's 2023. I was listening to Bertha's words there when you played them. That's eight years ago, more than eight years ago, like nothing's changed. You know, like, I mean, really in terms of action, have, has any, would she say anything different now? I really don't think she would. And honestly, like, it makes, when I hear her and when I just coming back from COP, it just makes me realise how much we miss, you know, the sharp sort of political analysis that she had, right, you know, and, and why the knowledge and the sort of analysis from Indigenous leaders is so important. It's, you know, by framing the situation and the solutions and the problems in, 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 a, in a very different way than most of our political leaders seem capable or seem willing to do. And what gave you the most hope at the UN Climate Summit? I mean, there was so much wrong. Also, the yeah. suppression of, uh, you know, political dissent. Climate leaders yeah. talked about how they were spending all their time making sure people weren't debadged who wore uh, Palestine yeah. lanyards or held up uh, flags. They're not allowed to hold up flags of countries, so they would hold up flags of watermelon, for example, around uh, protesting in support of Gaza or ceasefire now. You had the climate justice advocates. You had those who were trying to raise the names of political prisoners held by the United Arab Emirates. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, that it, it, the, those protests in which we're, we're calling for a ceasefire now and, you know, trying to make the link between, um, 
you know, to, to, to try and put a spotlight on the utter environmental ca catastrophe that is being, um, you know, um, that's carried out in Gaza at the same time as in parallel to the genocide in Gaza, right? That, you know, water, food, agriculture, it's all being purposefully targeted. And that message of you can, there is no climate justice without human rights was absolutely sort of suppressed by the UNFCCC, which respond, which which is responding to the countries that, you know, within within the framework. And um, people weren't allowed to mention Israel, never mind hold up a flag. It was just unbelievable. And um, what gave me hope, I mean, talking to indig indigenous peoples and learning from them is always hopeful because I don't it, it tells me, it teaches me that we have the solutions. You know, we we there are ways to fix this that don't involve um, huge, you know, expensive technologies that are going to leave everyone else behind. But I, I, honestly, this year, I think it was, um, I attended a press conference and interviewed a bunch of kids um, that were there with UNICEF and a young 14, a 14 year old boy from um, Colombia um, called Francisco, he used his five minutes that he had in that. So, you know, it was one of those half an hour press conferences and there was like four kids, one kid from um, the DRC, um, Francisco from Colombia, a 12, a 13 year old girl from Madagascar and a 13 year old girl from um, Libya. And they, I mean, just the compassion and the sort of clarity with which they spoke was so inspiring and so like, it, it may, you know, you, you, you just think it's not, it's not that hard. Right? If you really want to fix this, it's not that hard. And Francisco took his five minutes to raise questions which the adults just were refusing to do or were unable to do. He just said, how can, how can rich countries keep telling us there is no money for climate finance when there is enough money to send all these weapons to bomb and to kill um, Palestinians in Gaza? How can that be true? How can there be money for tanks and, um, and, um, and bullets when there is no money for climate adaptation? And I just thought, you know, it's so obvious, you know, and like, two, you know, two days later, um, you know, the Biden administration, um, you know, the, the US vetoed the UN Security Council sort of ceasefire flyer vote and then, um, you know, bypass Congress to to authorize a sale of all that, you know, that weaponry to Israel. And I just thought, it's, I mean, it's just it's just not true. Right? You're making a choice. You're making a choice that the destruction of a land and a people, you have the money for that. We have the money for that, but we don't have the money to, to, to tackle the climate crisis. And that is like, the, the kids know it, the kids can tell you that. And that gave me hope, you know, but it's just like, it's so, um, yeah, it's so frustrating, you know, when you just think we, it's just time is running out. As Bertha said eight years ago, time is running out, you know, um, but the kids, yeah, they spoke with more clarity and more compassion really than uh, most of the political leaders that I heard. Nina, let's end with the words of Francisco, Francisco Vera. 14 years old from Colombia. The climate change is not just a changing uh, the, the, the environment, the planet, it's also changing the children's life. No? So it's, it's an a, a, a important moment to make also a call to continue our actions again against climate crisis and against the planetary crisis as the Committee on Children's Rights has uh, mentioned. No? It is a triple crisis, the pollution, the loss of biodiversity and the climate crisis. No? So there are, there are like many, many lines to take action. No? We have adaptation, we have mitigation, we have also loss and damage, the finance that it's so important. But for example, on adaptation and in general in all of uh, them, I would say that it's so important that it's the states can uh, include and integrate effectively and correctly that uh, lines no? in their, in their uh, national policies, programs and plans. No? Uh, for example, I could participate uh, in Brasilia uh, on September 
in the at the um, national uh, the, adapt the Brazilian national adaptation plan uh, with the Marina Silva Minister of Environment of this country and give also the, the perspective from children no we need that that process of making policies uh, include the children no not just in a consultative way also in a participative way Francisco Vera, 14 years old from Colombia, speaking at the UN Climate Summit. And we'll also link to Nina Lacani's piece, Young People's Plea to COP28, World Leaders Owe It to Future Generations. Nina Lacani, I want to thank you so much for your work and being with us today, senior climate justice reporter for The Guardian U.S., who was in Dubai for the COP28 Climate Summit. We'll also link to her latest piece, Indigenous People and Climate Justice Groups Say COP28 Was Business as Usual, as well as all the other pieces she wrote during COP28. Nina Lacani is also author of Who Killed Berta Cáceres? dams, death squads, and an indigenous defender's battle for the planet. To see part one of our discussion, go to democracynow.org.